Hey folks, welcome to the Cyber Hub podcast. It is November. I'm dedicating it to veterans. It's all about veterans. So before we get started on today's episode, though, make sure you subscribe so you get all 26 episodes of this series. Do so now by subscribing on your favorite podcast listening platform. If you're watching uh, us on YouTube, subscribe now, hit the bell uh, so you get notifications every day, Sunday through Friday. 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, you'll get a new episode with one of the heroes that this nation owes a debt to, and we'll highlight their stories in InfoSec. So joining me today is Tom Marsland. He is the chairman of Veteran Sec, and we're going to talk a little bit about what Veteran Sec does. Tom, welcome to the podcast, man. How you doing? I'm doing great, James. Thanks for having me here today. Um, thanks for uh, coming on. I really do appreciate it. And you're still active duty. So for everyone kind of uh, wondering, hey, hey, Tom is, uh, I know Tom, Tom's active duty. You're still active duty, right? You're not ready to quit yet. Not quite. I've got 19 years in and a few more to go. So you enlisted 2001? I did. Yeah. Right before 9-11. So what was your official enlistment day? August 7th, 2001. Okay. And um, um, where'd you do basic? Great Lakes. Oh, lucky. How come you didn't end up in Fort Sill if you're Army? No, I'm Navy. Oh, you're Navy? I am, yep. Okay. I thought I saw you earlier with Army uniform on. I don't know why. Uh, so the Navy's changed their uniform a few times over the years. We're in a, they call them Type 3 Navy working uniform now. But yeah, it I, looks a little, little Army-ish. It looks a little Army-ish? I guess they got jealous. Um what can I say? Army uniforms are, are pretty badass, you know? Well, I'm sure we don't want this to just turn into an Army Navy. But uh, <laughs> There's I'll, a football game that. to settle that debate. There's That's an right. annual football game to settle that debate. Um, you know, I don't know if they're playing it this year. Are they playing it this year? I don't know. They've got to be. They've got to find a way. I don't know. I mean, if Army doesn't play the Navy one year, that, that feels like... You know, we had baseball during World War II. You want to tell me during a pandemic we can't have an Army Navy football game? Yeah, I, I bet. I bet we'll find a way to make it happen. So yeah, this isn't about the Army and Navy. Every branch of the military is just as valuable as the Army. Um, <laughs> um, <coughs> um, but we'll. Um, um, tell us a little bit about why you enlisted and then you've been in for 19 years. So obviously there's something keeping you around. Sh- share with us. Yeah, a absolutely. Bit. Um, my grandfather served in the Navy in Korea. He was okay. in the Korean war for four years. Um, and that was a huge inspiration to me. And then I grew up in the Pacific Northwest and all the time I'd look out my window and see Navy ships, Navy submarines sailing by. And just those two combined, um, you know, didn't really know what I wanted to do after high school originally. And, seemed like a good idea then. And, uh, what's keeping me in really, uh, there's a lot of things. I've got a family of four kids, uh, now. And so the medical benefits and everything else that comes with staying into retirement has kept me around. Just the thing that I enjoy the most now really is at my rank, I get to mentor a lot of sailors and I get to interact with them. And in that capacity, uh, my current job, I'm kind of an oversight organization for multiple commands. And I get to just go down and talk to sailors and see what they're doing and see how I can help make their processes a little better. And I really enjoy doing that. That's, um, th- that's a good kind of job to have, which is to mentor the people who are just getting started, who are between, do I want to do my four or six year tour and then go into civilian life or do I want to make a career out of the military? What made you want to make a career out of it? Uh, really just great leaders from the beginning. I had a, a couple of chief petty officers that, really mentored me and showed me kind of what the the long term would look like if I stayed in and just just them being there for me and that close knit community is really what's kept me around so far. Yeah, there's something about, you know, I've done a bunch of these episodes and even me myself as a veteran I always say um the one thing you miss is that brotherhood that you have in the military. Like that brotherhood is something that you don't find in the civilian life. It just doesn't exist in the civilian life. I don't know how to explain it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my largest command, um, seagoing command had no more than about 150 people. 
So, you know, at our level in at the E70, 89 rank level, there was only 10 to 15 of us. And so we got really close, especially on those long deployments. And they were they were family to me. You know, they're people you could talk to every day that you work next to every day. So just an awesome experience. Have you done any overseas tours? I haven't been stationed overseas. I've deployed overseas. But. OK, um, brilliant. So, um, you know, it's it's um, for, for those listening. I'm, I'm being very careful with my questions with Tom simply because he's still in active duty. And I don't want to ask him anything that could jeopardize our men and women in uniform or let our opponents. Because once we record this, we don't know where it's going to end up. I think everyone who's in cyber knows that once you put something on the Internet, there's no way of getting it back. Um, it's out there and you're not getting it back. And so um, I'm being very mindful of my questions because a lot of times, Tom, I shoot out questions and, and we get really into it. But I'm being, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm being the intel uh, person that, that I was and in, in asking and, and, and formulating the right questions in order, one, to keep you safe and number two, to keep our men and women safe and not give our opponents anything they don't need to know. Um, so tell us a little bit. So you're you've got about three more years um, before you get to hang the uniform and kind of try to transition into civilian life. You founded Veteran Sec. Tell us a little bit about you know Veteran Sec and what you guys are doing because you're the chairman of of Veteran Sec. Yeah, uh, just one little correction. I didn't found the organization. Okay, it's been sorry. around since 2018, um, but I took on as chairman of the board here back in June of this year. Um, VetSec is a 501c3 registered nonprofit here in the United States. We accept service members and veterans from all branches, including the National Guard and Reserves. And it's really just the mission is to help veterans transition into InfoSec. That's really the whole goal of what we do. So how do you guys do that? So first it starts out with, with a member signing up. They'll go to our website. They'll see that we have a sign-up sheet. We'll What's do some website? vetting. It's veteransec.com. Okay. Uh, and they'll go there, they'll sign up, they'll get vetted by us. We'll make sure that they are military, that they are who they say they are. And then they'll get an invitation to join our Slack community, which is a collaborative like Microsoft Teams. Um, once there, they find numerous channels that go to mentorship, mock interviews, resume assistance. We've got channels of, of members who have transitioned who are pretty senior in InfoSec giving advice on a technical technical aspects. Um, we've got it, people talking about education, degree programs, how to use your VA benefits, how to go through the medical process, really kind of every aspect of a transitioning guy coming out of the military is covered. And really it's, it's just guys giving back to, to the people that are still in uniform. We've got over 2,300 members now that are all in the slack and I, I you can ask any question in there and you're not going to wait more than five minutes before you get an answer from somebody who has seen it or done it or heard of it before. That's brilliant. And any person who's a veteran or have served in the service can join veteran sec and get support to start their career in InfoSec. Absolutely. Completely free of charge too. Are you guys looking for any uh, strategic partnerships? Kind of what's the future of the organization? How do you see it kind of going from here and as you transition into civilian life in a few years what do you see what do you see more happening um so we're trying to formalize a mentorship process right now um, we've developed some learning paths so say for me for instance i don't have a cybersecurity background from the military i've picked a lot of that up on my own um, if somebody wants to get into infosec they hear hey cybersecurity is where it's at but they don't really know how to go we have put together a lot of online resources that are readily available, whether it's Professor Messer's videos for Security Plus and all sorts of things like that to try and guide them into these are the foundational things you need to know, you know, to be part of InfoSec. And then our formal process really is the goal is to get them assigned to a mentor who's going to help them figure out, okay, what, what aspect of cyber do you want to go into? Do you want to be a penetration tester? Do you want to go into governance, risk and compliance? Do you want to go into, um, you know, digital forensics? And if so, we're going to pair you up with somebody who's senior in that area who can kind of guide you on what your next steps are going to be. Um, as far as partnerships, we, we have a few. Um, we've had some companies reach out to us looking for candidates, and we'll try and try and vet our guys and, and provide them some, some names. Um, but really, it's been learning resources at this point. Um, E-Learn Security. Hack the Box, Offensive Security, um, and Immersive Labs. We're still talking with Immersive Labs, but all of those that I mentioned have signed up to 
give vouchers to some of our members uh, just through their own generosity that we can help help our members upskill into those fields with those. Yeah, we'll definitely mention those companies and give them credit um, to anyone that's you know volunteering or donating to help veterans um, or even service members that transition. I'll tell you, one of the reasons I started um, th- this series for, for the month of November 1 is because I felt like uh, veterans get two days a year. And I think I told you that before we went live, but one yeah. of the things that really ticks me off, I've actually made a t-shirt and I should wear it on one of the podcasts that says, don't say happy Memorial Day. There's nothing happy about that day. Absolutely. Um, and um, I, I've seen it on on you know LinkedIn and social media where people say, happy Memorial Day weekend, everyone. And you're like, that's an oxymoron in your statement. Like, take a moment, reflect. Um, and I think for many of us that served, that day is a day of, of, of that weekend is a somber weekend. I mean, I can't remember the last time. I didn't, I've never fired up my barbecue, I think, on Memorial weekend, ever. No, I haven't either. It's definitely just kind of a quieter weekend to think about things. Yeah. I mean, you, you end up spending more time in cemeteries, um, at least I do, than, than, you know, in your home or anywhere else and, and with families and you end up, I will tell you this, I have to build up my alcohol tolerance before Memorial Weekend, um, simply because you end up drowning about three, four, five bottles of bourbon or whiskey that weekend. Um, You do, because you're meeting up with, you know, some of the people who you serve with, you don't see all year now in civilian life, right? People are in different parts of the country, but come Memorial Weekend, we all somehow convene somewhere. Yeah. Right? And so you end up drinking all weekend. That's that's pretty much how it starts and how it ends. Yeah, I can see that. Um, you know, military people drink. That's what we do. That's what else can you do? So let's talk a little bit about um, the transition in civilian life. How are you preparing yourself for three years from now? What have you started to do? Um, so the biggest thing is research at this point, research and networking. You know, I've talked to a lot of people who have transitioned already, and kind of the biggest thing I said was, hey, get out there and start networking and talking to people who have already made the transition, learn from them. Um, that's what actually what brought me to VetSec, was I've, I've taken an interest in cybersecurity. I've kind of done a little bit of the job here in the Navy. Um, I was a help desk manager at one of my shore duties for a couple of years. Um, started getting interested there, and then I went and got my bachelor's degree while I was on my last shore tour. Um, in IT security. Um, now I'm working on a master's degree using tuition assistance at this time and just started talking to people. And then I found VetSec and t- seemed like a great organization. There was tons of people willing to provide advice. You know, a lot of them were, oh, well, you're three years out. You've got plenty of time. Come <laughs> back in a little bit. Um, but then June came around and they were looking for some volunteer help. Um, and the person that was originally said, I'll I'll help out and be on the board as the chair had to step away for some personal reasons. So I threw my name in the hat and here I am today. So when you hear people kind of, you know, we, I'd say most military people are very mission oriented. So when do you, um, as you're starting to transition, at what point do you really start actively looking? Was it three months out, six months out? When do you really kind of start looking at civilian roles? How far? Um, I, I mean, seriously looking at them, I'm going to recommend anywhere from from six to nine months out. Okay. Personally, um, I'll tell you right now, I'm already looking myself just to kind of see what the titles are and where the jobs are. Um, I have a lot of members who work in all all different places in the country, and they're telling me, "Hey, if you want to." You know, if you want to work in the Midwest, these are the certifications that most companies out there start to look for. If you want to live up in the Pacific Northwest, this is kind of where you should be guiding people. Uh, but really, it's it's going to be relying back on that that group of guys in VetSec and and really the military people that have come before me to to kind of help with that process. Yeah, it's um th- that that's interesting because you you say six to nine months. A lot of people, you know, I get phone calls of someone saying like, "Hey, I'm supposed to be discharged next month. I don't know what where where to start." And that's th- th- that's a challenge. I think since you're enlisted, I want to bring up something that I I actually had a conversation around uh, with uh, Patrick Gall, who's the executive director of the NTSC, which is the National Technology Security Coalition. 
mm-hmm. they're they represent um, um, Fortune 1000 CISOs on the Hill in terms of legislation and so forth. And sure. um, one of their uh, initiatives is workforce development and and building veterans. And John Felker, formerly of CISA, has now joined the board at the NTSC, and he's doing a lot of great work there. And um, one of the the things that I constantly hear about and, and talk to people about is people who are transitioning out, not because it's the end of their um, contract or end of their serve ter- service term, but it's um, uh, they've been injured and they're given a medical discharge or they're going through a general discharge or, you know, everything other than this honorable discharge. Um, sure. And, and some of those people are in combat units. They're in, you know, they're not in InfoSec. And my question has been, and and no one's really been able to kind of answer it or or even take it take it up the chain is is why don't we instead of dismissing these people why don't we invest and put them in 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 infosec after all infosec these people don't see combat they don't need to be you know if they have a bum knee their bum knee isn't stopping them from sitting on a computer and doing infosec work why do you think we're still you know n- not capitalizing on on some of those situations. Well, I'll tell you, that reminds me of a question that, that came up. Uh, we just did a conference last weekend for, for all of our members, and that a question got asked there was uh, talk about the stigma of mental health and veterans. And, hey, why do right. some companies feel reticent to hire veterans? You know, are they, you know, they don't understand PTSD or they don't understand these mental health issues that we we tend to suffer from at greater rates than, than our civilian counterparts. And really, I think it's it's just education. Um, I think there's a lot of people that just don't understand. And I think that this pandemic, if anything good comes out of it, you know, we talk about all these mental health issues that now everyone in the civilian population is, is having issues with as well. And I think that's going to open their eyes a little bit to what the veteran population has gone through quite a bit for, for so many years. Um, I don't have a good answer for you for why companies don't, you know, reach out more and, and work on hiring those vets. But you talk about the guy who's getting discharged and he doesn't know what he's doing next week or, or next month. You know, we've got to get companies out there pushing to, to get this transition preparation more left than it is right now. You know, the fact that DOD Skillbridge, which is a wonderful opportunity, you know, you, you aren't eligible for it though until you're in your last six months. Well, your last six months on active duty, you're also working on getting your VA stuff all squared away, filing your disability paperwork, looking for that job at that point. You know, um, SANS Vet Success Academy, also another great tool. Um, I, I plan on applying for it, but you have to be in your last six months on active duty. You know, you, you can't tell me that, hey, a guy who does it a year and a half before he separates is going to forget everything. Like, that's just, that's, that's not how that works, you know. Uh, there's so many of these opportunities that companies put out there for vets, but they cram them all in that last six months on active duty is the only time they they're eligible for them. And nobody's working to push that left. And one of the things that's driven me crazy, I haven't even gone to the course myself, but uh, the transition assistance programs that the military has, you know, just as the chairman of VetSec trying to get our name into those programs, Hey, you know, you're a vet interested in transitioning into CyberSec, here's a company you should go reach out to. They're a nonprofit. You know, there is no central point of contact to get our name out to people on active duty. If I want to get VetSec's name into a TAPS class happening up here in the Pacific Northwest, I have to call that base and talk to that director of that program. And if I want to do it for some base on the East Coast, then I have to make the time to call that place as well. And so it's really almost stonewalling companies who are trying to get out there and help veterans as well. Yeah, it's, um, I think that's one of the challenges that we've all, we've heard a lot of people talk about within the VA, right? When people get out and they need medical stuff in the VA and you got to wait nine months to see a doctor, yep. um, you know, that's, uh, I'll give you a prime example. I've been, I've, I've had COVID twice. And, um, I, I had the first time I got it was in March, right? When it broke out, I was, I was on a flight back from Israel. I came back at the 14 day incubation period. And on day 14, I got sick. So I know I got it on the airplane. What mm-hmm. happens when you're on an airplane with 200 people for 14 hours during a pandemic, you're going to get COVID, um, yeah. just <laughs> general rule of thumb. Um, and then 
The second time was just recently, last month. So um, my wife and I tested positive, and we quarantined at home, you know, ordered online, so forth. And um, on Friday, Friday of, of last week, what, what, were Wednesday five days ago? Yeah. The uh, health department shows up on our door to see if we need anything. Two weeks later. <laughs> yeah. Right? We're like day 18 of COVID at that point. And so I look at the two ladies and I go, listen, I know you're doing your jobs. But I go, if you ever thought that why government shouldn't run healthcare, here's proof and point. If my health was relying on you coming to give me medication and food, I'd be dead by now. 18 days, I'd be breaking in my emergency MREs. Yep, absolutely. So I get that. I think that's one of the I think that's one of the things where we um, as veterans kind of need to do a better job at, which is communicating this as we get more uh, speaking time in front of the legislature and in front of people who make decisions as to go like, hey, let's privatize this veteran transition out. Let's let's you know, we have all these great defense contractors. Let them all throw in money in a pot and let's hire a private company to do this. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's there's multiple ways to make this process better. And right now, it just seems like it's stagnating. And like I said, I'm three years out. I haven't gone through the courses myself. But from what I hear from veterans that are already out, they're, they're pretty lacking. Um, and there are benefits that the VA provides, like vocational rehab, VR&E, that right. some guys go through the transition program and they don't even know exists. I talked to somebody just the other day, and they didn't even know that was an option for them. Yeah, that that seems to be um, common because there's so much, there's so many programs and so much stuff happening that most people, you know, like you said, the last six months of your service are so intense because you have to do so much, including your job. You don't get a six month break, right? To be like, hey, you've got six months left. You've given us, you know, five and a half years, three and a half years. Take the next six months, you know, go easy. No, no, no. You still have to do all your job. And t- technically, in the last six months, you're, um, depending on your role, um, you're busier than the first five years of your service or three years yeah, of your service. Absolutely. And so, um, and, and on top of all of that, you got to plan your life thereafter. Yep. And I think that's that's a challenge that we need to resolve. And that's a great point of bringing up here. And, you know, any ideas, any people who are listening, who are in a power in a position where they know people in power who can help uh, build the commission to address this or even just enact changes. We don't need any more commissions, but even just enact structural changes to the process would be would be greatly appreciated. Let's talk a little bit about why you want to, because you're not in cyber in the Navy. Correct. Why cyber? What brought you to cyber? Um, I'll tell you, <laughs> it's cool. Um <laughs> <laughs> no, I, it's something I enjoyed, you know, um, as a kid growing up, my uncle, uh, when he was still with us, he ran a software company up here in the Seattle area. Um, I would always go over to his house and he'd be showing me the latest and greatest thing on his 386, 486 PC, you know, just learning to tinker around with stuff like that. And then, uh, I was on a short duty teaching for the Navy and they said, Hey, we need somebody who knows something about computers to go run this help desk. We had two Navy ITs up there, and but no supervision. Um, I was already an E7 at that point and said, sure, you know, I know a little bit and I'm willing to learn and go up and be a manager, really. Um, but I got to learn a ton from them. We had some civilian network administrators there that taught me a, a crazy ton. Um, and it's just grown from there. That's what got me interested in going after the degree. And then, and then now I'm working on the master's program. Where, where are you, who are you doing your master's program with? It's with the University of Charleston, West Virginia. Okay. Yeah, West Virginia's got a got. A, you know, the five thousand universities in the U.S., private and public, uh, only eighty six have cyber programs. There's not many. I knew that. Let yeah, that when, number let that number sink in. Eighty six out of five thousand. Yeah, even that's crazy. I went. Uh, and got my bachelor's degree from Western Governors, which okay. I'm, I know a lot of people have gone after that program, and that was really rewarding. Taught me a lot. Um, 
masters is very much more high level policy oriented, but so far I've really enjoyed the program and I'm learning a lot there too. So what certs are you going to go after? Right now I'm prepping for my OSCP. Okay. Um, I've got a handful of CompTIA certs and I'm Cisco CCNA and CCNA security certified. Brilliant. So you're not leaving, you're going to come out, you're going to have a CV with all these certs on it. Your LinkedIn profile is going to have so many like, uh, names, uh, so many, uh, four letter, uh, um, four, four letter, uh, certs on there. It's going to go out the door. Yeah. Uh, and that's the goal, right? Um, like you said, military being mission oriented, you know, I'm looking at, you know, I have junior sailors who their last three months in and they're still trying to figure out what they want to do when they get out of the Navy. Um, and they're, they know they're getting out. They just don't know what they're doing. And I know I'm getting out, but I also know I've got a family to provide for and I've got three years to prep. So I want to hit this out of the park as soon as I, as soon as I walk out the door. That's brilliant. So um, for those employers or recruiters that are listening to the podcast, um, I'd, I'd get Tom like someone who you build a relationship with. So six months out, you can get him placed uh, somewhere because uh, that this is an impressive, impressive person. Like it's really been a delight. So I want to ask you one thing here as we wrap up. We're, we're, we're nearing our 30 minute mark. And so tell me uh, what's the one thing you've loved about your military service and you're loving right now? Oh, it, it's definitely the people, James. Um, you know, one of the coolest experiences I had was back in 2018. I got to deploy on a submarine and we surfaced up at the North Pole and we got to go out on the ice um, with, you know, all 150 of us, uh, obviously taking turns. But there was a British submarine that came up with us and just seeing the brotherhood between the United States sailors and the British sailors and getting to talk to, to all these people that chose submarines as their service and just, just that that family orientedness of of the service is something that I will always treasure. So, did you guys visit Santa up in the North Pole? We, I do have a picture with Santa <laughs> at the North Pole. <laughs> did you show that to your kids? I did. Yep. Yeah. What would they say? Santa's real? Like, have they had the bubble burst yet, or is it uh, now they're I'm fully in sure, Santa? I'm pretty sure my ten year old has the bubble burst. I'm pretty sure she could figure out that it was just somebody dressed up. But uh, <laughs> my boys definitely were like, oh, my God, that's so cool. They ask you if you went to Santa's workshop and if you saw the elves and any of that. Uh, no, no. They were just like, oh, it's dad was Santa. Cool. Went back to playing their video game. <laughs> Brilliant. Tom, thanks so much for agreeing to come and share your story on the podcast. Um, it's people like you who, one, make this the greatest country to live in in the world. Um, <laughs> I love our country. I really do. And, and, um, we wouldn't be where we are without people like yourself who, you know, I gave four years, you've given 19 and you've got three more. So that's 22. So that's quite a lot more than I've ever given. And, and, and I do thank you for that. That's, um, that's really above and beyond, especially with a family with four kids. Typically, uh, people like that tend to transition out because they've got a, they've got other things to worry about, but you've, you've, done the the honorable thing of staying in the service and that's greatly appreciated hey thank you very much james i appreciate you having me on today my pleasure folks um that's it for today's episode we're gonna have more episodes every single day sunday through friday we don't do saturday y'all know why jewish it's the sabbath i'm not gonna come down here and turn on the computer that i turn off on friday to post something and i don't want to schedule something out for you guys so I want you to spend your Saturdays with your families, with your loved ones. And then just know Sunday afternoon, you get out of church, got a podcast to listen to with a veteran, with your family, which could inspire your kids to want to go into the military and want to go into InfoSec. So that's it for us here today. We'll be back with more tomorrow. Until then, folks, thanks so much. Stay healthy, stay cyber safe, and uh, thank you to our veterans for your service. 